Hi everyone, welcome to another Discord live class. My name is Guru Fujita and today I'm gonna talk about lighting yet again. Um, so first of all, uh, I want to cover some ground by looking at um, these beautiful references and um, talk, walk you through how I think about uh, color and light. So let's start with this one, you know. Um, so a lot of times people think of snow being white, right? And then let me create a new layer here, something like this. But in reality, you know, it, the color, the local color is really dependent on what, like we know snow is white, but it's really dependent on how it appears, dependent how it appears, dependent on the lighting itself. So if you look at this, it's actually blue. So I picked the color here and you see in the shadow color, it's blue. Right? And only in the highlight area, it's actually white. And the reason is because sunlight reveals local color. Right? So a lot of people start painting snow just like this, but then they struggle. What is the highlight color? I already used the brightest color. Right? So for me, it's always easier to think of it as what is the environment, how it affects the subject. In this case, snow and blue sky looks something like this. Right, and then you will bring back the local color, which is white, and then it appears together like white in highlight and white in shadow. So let's look at this here. So um, we see, let me see, let me pick a red color here. The light is coming from here, right? So it's hitting the, the guy from the front, and it's causing these shadow areas here, right, which are blue. And the shadows are blue because the sky is blue and white reflects most of the color, black absorbs most of the color, right? Which is why we see here in the black area, we see little blue, although this black area is facing directly the sky. It is a cool black, but it's not as prominent as this because black is absorbing everything. Right. Okay, so now um, we have the key light coming from the front, uh, revealing the uh, local color here. It's the white of the snow, it's the beige of the, or the olive color or gray of the pants here. Um, for some reason, uh, I wanted to paint. Um, oh, I'm, I'm on the selection tool. So this is the highlight here. Here it reveals the red of the jacket, and here it shows the highlight of the black, and here more, more highlight of the red jacket, right? But then you might ask yourself, why is this area bright and why is this area dark? So uh, let me use a different color here so you can see it. This area is purely the shadow color of the red because now the light is coming from here and causing the shadow and it's only receiving the sky fill from the sky which is why this red is a cooler red than the highlight red right so if i pick this color you see it's a cooler red than the super hot orange highlight so now why is this area brighter than this area it's clearly brighter right so if you look at this um, i pick this color it's dark i pick this color it's bright and that is because of bounce light. So bounce light is the light that bounces off the ground and hits surfaces after it bounces, right? So we have like white reflects a lot of color. So there's a lot of white around here that reflects from all angles towards the sky, which is why we see so much of the local color of his clothing. And right? if if this was this was a black surface, you would not see this much um, bounce light, and the red would be much much darker, even darker than this, because black would absorb all the lighting and wouldn't cause this amount of bounce. So now, this area is dark because the bounce light is blocked by the surface, so it's going up, but it gets blocked by the surface, right? So it's it's kind of like this. And then this is isolated from the bounce light because the bounce light just ends here, right? Which is why you see a slight gradient from here where it's like bright to the top where it gets darker. 
right? Because the balance side has a fall off as well. So this is why these, uh, this red area is bright. So this is basically what I think about when I paint is key light, fill light is like the reflected light in the shadow and then the bounce light. If you combine these uh, three things, um, you get to a decent result already. But on top of that, you have to think about curvature, right? So let me change the color a little bit so you can see it. So if you have a surface like this, right, you will see that this area where the light hits perpendicular and gets reflected perpendicular from the surface is the brightest, and then the light falls off this way. Right? So this is all in the same highlight area, highlight zone, but you have different values within the highlights. So let's take this and look at this here. So you see the light is hitting directly this jacket, which is why this is a really hot highlight. We have the same hot highlight here because this is getting directly hit by the light, right? But then we have this area where it's facing down, right? This is getting a little bit of light, but it's, it's still brighter than here, but it's darker than the main highlight because this is directly getting hit by the light, all right? Here, another thing you can notice is here, the, this curvature, right? So this is black, this is black, this is black, but you can see this black here is darker then this black here is darker than this black here. And then here, once it turns away from the sun, it gets black again, right? So here we have the brightest spot. So another important thing to know is um, black in highlight is brighter than white in shadow. It's, it's like, what? Is it really true? But, you know, if you pick this color here, like the brightest color in the, uh, uh, in the blacks, and pick the shadow color here, you see that the shadow color is actually darker. Even this is like a much brighter local color, right? So this is white, this is black, but black in highlight is brighter than white in shadow. So this is like a really cool little trick. So for example, if I have a penguin, let's have a penguin here, right? and then uh, maybe its belly is, is, is white in shadow. And we have the beak, beak and shadow, something like this. And, you know, people ask me, like, how do you choose the shadow color? And this is like the hard part. This is experience. Right? That doing, through study and stuff, you know, by studying light and color, you will be able to understand how to choose, um, how to choose the shadow color, or you will be able to start seeing what the shadow color is. Now, if I light this from here, the black becomes almost like a brown grayish right see now it still looks like black but it looks like black and highlight but once i bring it over here right it doesn't look that way unless you manage to match all the other uh colors as well so here because it's lit from the top the penguin would be white on the top right and then even the beak needs a highlight here. And once you have all of this combined, it reads again as the local colors. Adding the bounce light here on the ground, right? Like let's say like this is um, snow. So you will have bounce light on the ground like here. Not as strong as the uh, key light on the top. And then on this side, you will have also uh, a bounce light, something like this. Right now it looks like it's lit from the bottom, you know, and um, uh, through the bounce light and lit from the top through the key light. So um, this is how you can, like how uh, adjacent color, and color is relative dependent on what kind of color is adjacent to one another. Let's go to the next, um, next ex uh, example here. So for example here, um, you see like a lot of people teach, um, and teach that color and shadow is always cool and highlight is warm, but it really depends on what is 
uh, around, depends on the environment colors, right? So this is like an indoor environment. And I'm guessing from looking at the walls and looking at the uh, shadow color, this is like a um, pretty neutral wall color, maybe beige or something, maybe white. But imagine there's a window here. There's a window here and there's light coming through that window. All the walls here will create the fill light. So now we don't have a sky anymore, right? Because the sky is on this side, but inside the house you have walls, which is why the shadow colors are not cool at all, right? You see like they're like all warm. If this was outdoors, this would be similar to this. It would be like blue, right? But because this person is indoors, you know, like the white is re um, reflecting all the wall colors, which is more neutral uh, and maybe a little bit slightly warmer, and which is why it affects the shadow colors in that way, right? And look at this beautiful bounce light here. So again, here we're dealing with like a white piece of cloth. So the light is coming through here, reflecting, oops, reflecting off the cloth, bouncing back. And you see here the beautiful bounce light on this side, right? And you see how strong it is. Look at this. This is also just bounce light. There's no direct light hitting it, but it hits these surfaces here, a little bit of the yellow, and bounces back and cr creates like this nice little bounce rim. What you see here is not bounce light. This is actually subsurface scattering. So um, flash and like um, certain objects like uh, gel and stuff like that, um, the light penetrates through the uh, first layer and then it starts scattering around inside, creating this thing called subsurface scattering, right? So once it starts scattering, um, it really, um, when warm light hits um, flash, it starts scattering the light inside and then it bleeds out like this or you know like this is not caused by bounce light this this bright area this is actually because the light is hitting really hard getting scattered in the flash and then you see this nice flesh tone here which is caused by subsurface scattering and you see it also like here in this area as well and this wouldn't happen with like um, solid metal or plastic or wood, you know, those are not, it happens with wax. So you probably know like uh, the candle effect when you shine a light against a candle, it has like this super nice translucent um, scattering effect, right? So um, this is another thing to consider. Um, depending on the material, the uh, behavior towards light uh, changes. All right. So now uh, let's go to this one. And I chose this one to really emphasize what I talked about here, the curvature, right? So this surfboard here, you know, like has not just one value, and there's actually multiple values here. So this, this area here is in highlight, this area is here in highlight, and this area is in shadow, right? So, but if you think about it, why do you have different values within the highlight and different values within the shadow? like over here and over here, is because the surfboard has a curvature, right? So let me draw it like this. So this area, the light is coming from here. Obviously, you can see it by looking at her. And this is the area that is perpendicular to the light, which is why you get that super bright white highlight, almost white highlight. And then, this is all in highlight, but it, it starts uh, following the curvature where it becomes more the local color. So it's still the highlight area, but then it starts um, being more saturated because um, it's facing away, starting to face away from the light. And then we have um, the bottom part. Uh, we have the shadow part here, actually. This is her shadow on the board. And you see it's a cool yellow because the sky is blue. So the blue of the sky merges with the local color of the yellow creating almost like a greenish, olive green type of shadow color, right? And then in the end we have this, which is shadow plus bounce light. So just by looking at this, I can assume that the ground is probably something warm, like a, a beach ground or something, something like this, right? 
And if I look at the refraction reflection, I see that I'm right. You know, there's like some brown in there. You can see some brown in here. And just because the bounce light is warm over here, right? So it's it's basically getting reflected off some warm ground. And then here in the white basket, you see the sky color reflected again, which is um, blue, right? So um, everything is consistent, similar to this. It's blue because it's blue sky. And here it was uh, warm because it was a warm wall, right? That was reflected. So, um, but also important to note is that there's, um, just like I said here, pointed out here, there's um, brighter highlights within the highlights and there's darker shadows within the shadows. So even here, when you look from bottom to top, it goes from brighter, warmer, to darker and cooler. And this is exactly what we were seeing here with the jacket, from brighter, warmer, to darker, cooler. And this is caused by the bounce light coming from the ground. Right? So the ground is reflected here. And because it's a sand ground, it's a warm, high, uh, warm shadow here. But as we go up, the surfboard also has a slight curvature start facing the sky so now the blue comes in and makes the yellow a little bit cooler and very much at the top there's no light hitting this because it's a shadow within a shadow and then you have the darkest spot right here so um this is like um how i usually break down my paintings and um this is like might be fairly easy to follow what i was talking about here um but um you can dig into the rabbit hole forever, right? So for example, if you take it to a very complex reference, it's this. So this is a photo from Greece. And you see this shadow is different from this shadow, different from this shadow, different from this shadow, different from this shadow, different from this. And you see all kinds of different shades and hues for the same shadow, right? But why is that? Why is this shadow, although it's a white building, different from this shadow? And this is because of the environment, right? We have a blue sky here, but also these are like clustered buildings. So they will bounce light off of each other like crazy, right? Because white, as we learned before, is the most reflective. So what's going to happen is, um, let me turn on the layer here. It's going to bounce around like like wild like wildfire, right? It's going to be like this, Ooh, spread like wildfire. Wah! So it bounces around like crazy. So why is this blue? Because of the blue door and also the sky fill, right? So this so basically the light is coming from here. Right? Hitting hitting this wall. This area becomes blue but also because there's a bounce light from he from this door against the wall we see that there's a shadow here but there's a highlight here and that affects the wall color over here but why is this shadow color not blue just because all of the buildings next to it bounce light back and overpowers overrides the blue of the sky and an explanation for that is if you look at this building here it does actually have a blue shadow here because there's nothing around that could contaminate this blue shadow right same thing here this might actually be blue because this roof is blue here and it's bouncing back um the light from the blue ground but it, look at this this is a shadow area but it's pink why is it pink? Because of the ground here, because of the walls here that are pink. All the buildings around are pink and they're affecting the shadow color here. So basically it's overpowering the, uh, the color of the sky. And here you can see it beautifully, right? How you can see the warm bounce here and then it slightly falls off and gets cooler where the sky fill is coming in and taking over again, right? So you see like this beautiful gradient here from the warm bounce to the cooler bounce light. So you see how complex it can get. Like it's the same principles that I explained beforehand, but taking it to the next level, it would be something like this where, you know, you're following the same rules, but 
you know, you have so many different angles, different perspectives that and different curvatures that it becomes really, really difficult to oversee, right? Like this is this one I would never ask like a student to start with something like this because this is going to be overwhelming, you know. So it's always better to start with something simple like this. Although this is like already pretty complex, this is probably a good start. And this is why I want to today in this lesson um cover um cover it with a simple thing like a sphere, you know, because I think last time I, in my last lighting class, I used like an alien and um, it's it's kind of difficult to understand form and curvatures if you have a complex structure already. So this time I wanted to focus on a simpler subject. So I'm going to use a sphere to explain uh, my thought process when I create my paintings. So let's get right to it. So I'm going to show you guys now a demo of what I just showed. So let me let me start with um, like the ground plane here. Um, I'm just going to use the line tool here and then duplicate a few things around. Any questions so far? Um, uh, I see you like you um, duplicating stuff and like sometimes you like brush it uh, differently. But how do you like uh, when do you have to choose like um, when's the best time to duplicate stuff and um, when to actually paint it? Like, you know, like um, so um, for example, what I'm doing right now is probably not good for mobile, you know, like th this will still run on Quest and on mobile devices, but it's not um, it's not efficient. So, for example, if I would do this for mobile, I would probably do something like this and then add a little bit of like um, details on top of that just to um, um, be able to uh, cover some ground. But um, in terms of colorizing, the more strokes you have, the better you can um, control, say, for example, because Quill is based on colorization of strokes. If you color this, it will affect the entire stroke, right? So let me turn off the, it will do this. You can color this, but here you can color regions, right? So um, depending on what you want to do. So for example, if you have an arm here, and this is like um, what Danielle was talking about in his um, face tutorial, where like you have to know how Quill works, right? So if, if you, plan to only have a hard highlight here you don't have to do something like this you know like then then if you duplicate this you will get like weird results like this so if you want like a hard highlight here you can just duplicate this one stroke and then you get a perfect highlight so it really depends on like what you want to do for example in this example i'm going to um, paint a sphere and if i I could simply do something like this, uh, look at the topology, right, move it down, and then paint this shadow color of white, and then paint the bounce light from the bottom here, right? But if I want to light this area, I can't. It goes all, the, all around, right? And then if I would do this duplication, then it does this, which I don't want either, right? So in this case, I would just, you know, make sure that I leave something. Um, let me turn off the taper, something like the uh, something like this. And then I will duplicate rotate. Do the lathe technique and then and then I'm able to, you know, um, colorize it from all angles the way I want. So let me make it round, you know, and I'm gonna use this uh, for this example now, the sphere, but you can see like, you know, now I can light it the way I want, like anywhere. So depending on what you want, um, you, you're gonna, you have to change the way you paint, right? So, um, Perfect, man. thank you. Yeah. So now um, uh, one thing, one little trick here, um, this is a cool, cool little trick, you know, um, where is it? I don't see it. Is it too small? Where is it? Oh yeah, it's too small. So look at that. So I created like a one pixel wide um, um, PNG in Photoshop, which is basically like the stick gradient. So I basically created a gradient and made it only one pixel wide. But if you make it a 360 image, it becomes like a, 
sky gradient, right? So this is like this is like a really Whoa. cool Whoa. way. <laughs> this is like um, a Good super one. efficient way to create like gradients. You don't have to have a one K image or something like this. This is like super small because images um, are kind of large inside Quill. So if you like. make it like this, you know, and if you want. To move it to the center, all you need to do is like reset transform. It goes to the center. Oops, reset. Oh, because it's in a group. Hold on. Let me go out here. Reset transform. It goes to the center. And now what you can do is just mm -hmm. hold the green axis and just scale it, and you have a perfect gradient with a horizon, you know, aligned. That's great. That's awesome. So, so I'm actually going to uh, use the sky. Um, and then um, let me let me go back to the ground here. And because the sky is blue, the shadow color, let's say this is a forest ground, you know, it's probably something more purple like this. Because now this is a cooler version of this, right? So um, I add a little bit of blue. If you add a little bit of blue, it becomes purple, right? So because the blue merges with the red of the ground. And then here, the sphere in shadow, uh, where's my sphere? Let me remove the color palette here. And the sky is something like this, so um, the, the color for the sphere might be something like this. So this is good. Okay, and now, um, we have this uh we will add the sun so let me create a notes layer here hey we have the sun this is the sun whoa i'm shining down on you boom all right so we have the sun and then we have the sky fill and this can be um, in a room it would be um, the walls right so the sky fill will fill in the shadow side all, all this area and then we have the good old bounce oh bounce i don't know why i'm doing those sound effects makes no sense whatsoever <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is the bounce light, right? So keep that in mind, right? And and now everything I taught in the beginning, right? This area where the sunlight hits will be the brightest. So let's go to our good old um, sphere and start introducing a really hot highlight. So I'm not going to white. I'm going to like an orange white here because it's sunlight. And then I'm going to reduce the opacity here. And then I will make this area right. And then I go to super white. And then only the tip, where it, only the portion that reflects 100% of the light, boom, gets the white. And look, look at this. This is already looking pretty awesome, right? Now, the sun is hitting the ground. And then the sky is filling in the rest of it, right? But within the sky, where it faces up, because like the sky is like changing to the, towards the horizon line to a uh, regular vegetation, even in the sky fill, like if I pick this color, you will have a slight gradient. So it's gonna be slightly brighter on the top because it's facing directly to the sky, right? So now adding that, added a lot already right and then we we focus on the bounce light so the the leaves on the ground are like bouncing off the ground but before that i need a reason for that right so let me work on the ground a little bit so i'm i'm gonna add some uh, color variation here some random color variation a little bit cooler yellows maybe something like this and then I will add a highlight here. You know, so this is like this highlight. Maybe it gets like a little bit brighter, maybe a little bit yellower. 
and go a little bit more saturated. Something like this. This is nice. So now the the sphere is throwing a shadow obviously here. But then it's bouncing off all the color from the ground here. And now look at the magic, right? So white reflects a lot of the local uh, of the of the reflects a lot of most of the light. So I just add a little bit of orange here. Boom. Same thing here where it, it bounces off the most. It's the brightest like that. And look at that, right? So let me turn off the grid here so you can see it. But this looks pretty awesome, right? And this side, you know, because it's not getting any, so I can emphasize the bounce light here a little bit, but then, you know, only if you had more here, it will get reflected by the sphere. So only then, right? So it needs to be always justified. So look at that, right? And this is just by respecting the angularity, the curvature, key light, fill light, and bounce light. And you get like this beautiful illusion of light. All right? So this is pretty cool. Now, what happens if I want to animate light? Right? So let me bring back the sphere to uh, um, the shadow color. No, I destroyed it. <laughs> um, that's OK. And then um, I'm going to animate this. Uh, so, so what I'm going to do here, before I start animating this guy frame by frame, I'm already adding the diffuse coloration, right? So the, the top portion will be a little bit brighter because it's facing straight to the sky. And I'm also already adding the bounce light. But I'm, so now this is just a bounce light, right? Um, and the sky fill, there's no direct sunlight yet. So now what I'm going to do is I turn on, like we haven't covered this, um, this uh, functionality in a while, but Animate Duplicate Transform Selection is a very powerful functionality where you can just basically, you know, like once you start duplicating, it creates a new frame for you. So it's like, boop, boop, boop. jump, 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 jump. And then it slows down at the top slows down, slows down, and it becomes faster, becomes faster, becomes faster, and then it's, I'm gonna loop the animation, and then um, what happens is it's already a bouncing ball, right? So this is like a pretty cool uh, functionality. Remember to turn this off, you know, once you're done, you know, and then, um, let me see. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is like, I'm going to adjust the spacing a little bit and add a little bit of squash and stretch here with a grab tool. Um, just like this. Squash and stretch. And it starts stretching again a little. Oh, there's two spheres for some reason. I don't know why. And then and then this one goes down. <coughs> eh. And squash. Maybe scale it up a little. Squash. And then I'm going to thicken it to make it smoother. OK, let's see. OK, this is pretty cool, right? Um, but now it's like going through rays of light. So this is how you can do lighting um, in animation. So then let's imagine. There's some light sources coming through here. Light rays, right? Uh, let me make it a little bit thicker so it's more clear. So maybe there's one coming from here and Hi. maybe one coming from here. Who is speaking? <laughs> Somebody keeps talking. You might want to mute yourself if you don't if you don't have a question, but okay. So um, you see like this is where um, the light, so this is the light, uh, light. 
oh, perfect handwriting, um, but it makes sense, right? So um, now I basically select all the frames over time, and now I can see um, everything is selected, right? And now when when whenever they go through the light, I want them to um, I want them to be in highlight, right? So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm I'm going to use the colorizer tool. And maybe I can, uh, where's my color? Here. I choose the highlight color. And then I just paint the highlight here. And as it comes up, it goes into the light. And then it goes down into this light. So let me turn off the light layer. So because here, see, like this is like a pool of light. So I'm just going to really burn make it like really warm here and a lot of times what you see is also that um the edge between like uh, a warm and um bright uh warm and uh, cool shadow uh warm highlight and cool shadow you get like this transition effect where it becomes a little bit warmer on the edge right but now it looks like the ball is jumping into light Right, so this is cool. But now you also need a shadow. So for the shadow, I already have the shadow color here. So I'm cre create a new group, create a new layer. And then let me just go where we have the contact. And then I'm going to use the line tool and just draw a shadow. And let me use a different color first so you can see it. Something like this. Yeah, let me just thicken it a little bit. This is good. And now I'm going to uh, animate the group. And so I'm going to put it into another group. And then I'm just going to use, use step keys. And then go forward with animation. Maybe it be, oh, I have to turn on auto key. Sorry, guys. So auto key. Oops, becomes bigger, and now it becomes smaller, and I'm just going frame by frame. Oops, it went too fast. I skipped some frames. Oh, it's coming back already, I think. Let me see. Oops. Okay, let's see uh, if I did the right thing. Um, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, it comes back, comes back, comes back. Okay, let's see. There's a mistake somewhere. Boom. So I'm using, oh, there, there's a mistake. Um, I'm using transform keyframes here because that way I can adjust the um, um, color of the shadow later after the fact. So, yeah, that's good enough. Okay, so now I'm going to, uh, actually, you know what? I made too many frames here. It's gonna loop here. So I'm just gonna sequence it, loop it, and now it should, oops, now it should work, right? So now you have the shadow, but it's it's not frame by frame, so I can change the color at any time. So now I just choose the color from the ground and colorize, colorize it into the shadow. And now it looks like it's flying around, and then I will make sure that the ground here, where's the ground? It's not coming through here just with a grab tool and now you have like a super believable let me turn off let me make the background dark uh remove that sky dome um that will where's my sky dome here so you can really see how vibrant this is right so this this is how you can like um create the illusion of light and it totally looks like it's lit you know, um, somebody, I think, in the community said, like, yeah, Quill can only do, like, pastel colors and stuff, and um, can you do high contrast things? And 
really what Quill enables you to do is just use color the way you know it, right? So if you know how to use color, you can basically do anything because all it is is, is basically color, right? So um, contrast and, you know, shading and stuff all comes from how you treat your values and color. So, yeah, I mean, um, I wanted to do like a more simple breakdown with something like this, you know, um, because the last lesson I made, I made this alien. I think that was like maybe a little bit complex, you know, because um, a sphere is much easier to understand than like an alien body, you know. So I wanted to break it down like this um, um, to show you guys how I think. And it really, really depends like how you treat the um, white sphere here is really dependent on what the environment is. Even if I would paint in dark like this, I would imagine in my head, what is the environment, right? And um, everything changes the moment you change the environment. So for example, this won't work anymore. If you had like, um, for example, a lot of like uh, green canopy around you, you know? So if you have like canopy here, trees like this, all of a sudden the sky fill doesn't work anymore, right? It doesn't feel like it's, it, it's, um, it's lit anymore. It just breaks the illusion, right? And, um, you know, all you need to do here, um, I can try if, if this works actually, um, if I change the hue. Uh, I can do it in a still frame, actually. Let me just do it in a still frame um, so you guys can see. So, for example, here, as soon as it comes up, you know, you would then, in this case, respect that there's filtered light from the top, right? So, um, it would reflect the light from the top, and all of a sudden, it makes sense again. Right. So um, this is like something you have to always keep in mind when whenever you paint, everything is dependent on what's around you. Right. Uh, the light alone, you can't just like light without thinking about the environment. And this is actually why I always do the environment first, because the environment will define how things are being lit. Right. So, for example, if I put another sphere, let me copy the sphere um, into a new layer and put it in shadow you know here it might have the ambient occlusion at the bottom oops it's too strong oops what's happening <laughs> i selected something okay let me let me remove this again so we have the ambient occlusion Right, it's a little bit strong still. And we have the bounce light from here. But on this side, you won't have any bounce light because there's no highlight, right? But on the top portion, you have the sky fill. And see how it integrates itself perfectly. And then you move this ball over here. And all of a sudden you will have the bounce light on this side. So I'm, I'm gonna reuse it so you can just see the bounce light here. But you will also enter the highlight zone, right? So this is like where the light is hitting, starting to hit the ball. Right. And this is like how you can like always think of it. And I wouldn't be able to do this if I didn't have the environment first. Right. So it's like really important that you have those things in place first, you know, because otherwise um, it's going to be very difficult to identify how your lighting will behave in your scene. Any questions? We're almost at an hour. So I think I leave it at that for now. But do you guys have any questions? Um, yeah, would you paint in the core shadow, maybe? Um, you, you mean like here? Like on a sphere <laughs> when, when we're rendering, when there's a highlight, there would be a core shadow close to the middle part of the right, sphere. Right, right, here, right? Where it transitions, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here you can, you can totally do this, where it's a little bit darker 
than here because this one is like reflecting a little bit of the ground still you know and then it becomes and this is like too strong now but um the more you do this the more complex it becomes and now you see like it's actually working right so you can totally do this um um i didn't dive into these details because you know you can go endless it's a rabbit hole right <laughs> like yeah. yeah because um the thing is like you know it's easier to think of the principle of like where the light hits perpendicular that's the brightest spot right um i always try to simplify things you know because if you um think of these rule sets too much it's sometimes like confusing more you know so um for me it was like always easier to think of you know key light bounce light fill light you know and then combined with wherever the light hits perpendicular it will be the most uh, the brightest spot because then you know you will have a little bit of bounce here right and then this is the core shadow because this is not receiving le the least amount of light versus this is re receiving more of the sky fill right so um that's how you can explain the core shadow you know versus thinking of oh a sphere has a core shadow if you know what i mean like it's better to understand what is actually happening versus um focusing on like a like a principle for a specific thing like oh if we analyze a sphere this is what we do it's better to think about if i paint a sphere this is what's happening you know what i mean right yeah. okay I yeah. See. yeah so like by painting like starting from the shadow colors and painting in the light by result you get a core shadow correct right? yes so the more the deeper you dive into this you know the the more you will refine the lighting the more photoreal it will become so what i'm doing here this is like photoreal lighting right this is how um global illumination works in rendering and it just doesn't look photoreal because I didn't dive into it deep enough. But if I keep going and going and going, eventually it will look like a photo, you know, because then you just reproduce how the, um, the, the, uh, what global illumination does, how light um, bounces around a scene, you know. And um, this is like how I think about lighting, you know, like it's, it's I'm basically like a renderer, you know. So I'm um, basically thinking about how light is affecting surfaces, and the longer you spend, the the more the more detailed it will become, the more photoreal it will look, you know. But then, you know, the the beauty about um, doing something in Quill or Photoshop or something like that is like it's it's really up to you where you want to stylize, and sometimes you can even push the aspect you learned, you know, because while this is like a fairly natural uh, behavior, you know, once you know the rules, you can also break them and to uh, and push your art to the next level by just pushing certain things that you know but if you don't know the rule sets it's hard to break the rules right so um yeah it's it's like i really like um you know like having like a physical approach but also you know um approaching that a little bit like more cre in a creative way and just pushing the boundaries the way you want because you know like um, sometimes you want to um, emphasize certain areas of your painting and then you know like even if there would be a highlight you might not put the highlight there and that's a creative decision right and that's difficult to do in cg renders then you have to all of a sudden put like some shadow objects in there to prevent the light to go to leak into certain areas and when you create from the ground up like this you don't don't have to worry about those things so that's why i love creating from scratch you know and having full control over the lighting because then i can get exactly to the results the results i'm seeking um any chance we could get you to paint a little uh or maybe like a leaf on the top of one of those balls so i could see some subsurface scattering um like yeah so um you know like um i can give Maybe I can give this, I can show it with an ear. How about that? <laughs> I make this a rabbit or something. I think that looks better if I do this. Okay, so um, I put the uh, sphere here. What it will do is like the light is coming from there. So it's going to, let me, yeah. So let me rotate this a little bit and then, you know, you have the light coming from the top. You know, you have the beautiful bounce light here. 
So you can see I can't just reuse what I just did. I have to repaint things, you know. And then uh, this blue feels a little bit strong. So let me soften it a little bit. Yeah, this is good. And then I'm going to put some ears here. And then I'm going to make the ears actually blue as well because they're going to face us with a shadow color. And then I will duplicate this, pick the highlight color here and make the highlights. And then again, the light is coming from here. So the top portion will be brighter than the bottom portion. So just like the curvature here is different. So this will be like the brightest spot. Okay, this looks good, see? And then obviously here we need some shadows. So this can't stay lit. So we have the shadows here and there's some highlight coming through here. So we have a really strong light coming from there. And then um, the inner ear would probably be, the shadow color would probably be something like this. Right? But because the ear is thin and it's getting all the light from the back, now I can simulate subsurface scattering. But it gets like really warm, really hot. And all of a sudden it looks like it's lit from behind, right? And then here where it gets thicker, you don't get as much scattering. So now it looks like it's glowing, right? And the same would go for the leaves. So if you have a leaf here, This would be the local color of the leaf in, in highlight, right? But then if you look from the other side, a lot of times, it just becomes warmer and brighter. Then you have these um, bright leaves, and then you can simulate where the shadows within the shadows. Right, where, where the, basically where the leaves uh, throw um, their own shadows on the leaves. You could do that, you know, something like this. So it will look like it's, it's lit from above and it's always relative because then you also need like, um, you know, some leaves will be in shadow by default. Just like this. And in relationship, it will start looking really cool. So, you know, maybe this area is getting like subsurface translucency. This is actually translucency. It's not subsurface scattering where it just becomes more where the it's like paper, right? And then you see that now it's justified that the ear is being lit like that, right? So this is how you can do stuff as well. Makes sense. So good. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So fast. <laughs> so, so, so that's the thing, right? Like a lot of things, um, if you don't know what you're doing, you can get to the same result, but it will take you forever, right? But if you understand the concept, you can actually get to your goal much faster. So, you know, I think of my rabbit. This is my rabbit, right? And then I think of it. Okay, what is the shadow color? Well, the steps are... I have a blue sky. I have a warm, warm ground. Put it here, put it here, right? So this is now what I'm thinking. Now, because I have this, now I know what the, what the shadow color will be based on this and this. So I will pick the sky color, maybe make it a little bit darker. So this, this will be my, my rabbit in shadow, right? And then this ground in shadow will be probably something purple because the sky is blue. So I will choose something like this. And you see that I target the colors and this is the part that's really difficult. And this is the part that takes a long time to really know what the colors are, right? So sky stays the same color, right? Now I identified the shadows. Now, duplicate this over, think about where does the highlight land? Maybe here. 
Boom. What does the highlight do? Right? Little bounce on the body. And then little highlights on the sun. Right? But then again, this area is what gets gets brighter than this area, right? And so forth. And look, it already looks lit, right? So You know, and then if I change this to canopy, this is actually like um, a forest where you have like a lot of canopy, then you have to change your shadow color to something greener. Because white reflects green, right? And then um, white, white reflects the green, so maybe this is a little bit too extreme, so maybe something like this. This looks good. And then if there's a gap, somewhere here then you get the highlight again right Let me push this back just like this so now it makes sense here it makes sense here as well right so so basically it really depends everything depends on what's what's in your environment right and also what i didn't cover here i only covered white if this was red that's a whole different thing again, right? Because then how does this reflect the bounce light? What if this was blue, right? And what if, what if this was metal, <laughs> right? So then it goes on and on and on, and maybe I can do a stream about reflections and sometimes, sometimes, you know, because now, you know, like this bounce light is not going to be orange, right? It's going to be like this mixed with a blue, so it's probably something like more something like this, something purplish, right? And then the highlight here is not going to be white, it's going to be the local color, which is probably something like this. Same rule here, this area gets brighter, right? So, like, it really depends on. Um, what the local color is and what also the material is. If this was plastic, you know, you might have a very bright highlight here. And all of a sudden it looks in like a specular, right? And then you have to be consistent. You have to have it here too. Boom, boom. And then depending on materials, everything changes again, right? So for now, for today, I just wanted to cover like a white sphere because uh, white is easy, the most easy to understand because white is very reflective. So it reflects the most of the colors in the light and it's easier to understand. And I can do a more deep dive into like different local colors and different materials in a different stream maybe because this, this is literally like goes on and on forever, you know, like it's a it's an endless topic so any more questions as as a continuation of this it would be just great to see like the same thing you know the lightning on how do you um get that and reproduce it on the 3d like on octane and redshift like how do you okay you have the lightning here but like how do you actually uh add the light on the 3d software to actually um, make it better and how do you Managed to do both, and uh, that would be a great sequence to this, actually. Yeah, um, I'm cautious with that, actually, because um, the moment you automate, you rely on automation, right? So you actually, like, the thing is, like, the reason I can light in Redshift the way I want or in Octane is because I studied light, right? Before, I wasn't good at rendering. Like before I was like, oh, I had a spotlight here, I had an array light here, but I wasn't really sure what I was doing. So the renderings were like mediocre, you know. My renderings became much stronger once I actually understood um, how to paint light, because then I understood the fundamentals of what you need. So it's actually more important in my view to understand the principles like this, the basics, before you actually go into a software like um, like Octane or Redshift to let the computer do it. Because other, then you just let the computer do it and you don't know if it's the right thing, right? So um, uh, the thing is like when, when I was like in, um, in uh, when I was studying light through 2D paintings and stuff, you know, and I ended up like, um, 
doing 3D later, it was like a time travel where basically I went into the 3D software thinking that I don't know how to light. But all of a sudden, I knew exactly what to do. I rendered the first image and I'm like, okay, this looks wrong, this looks wrong, this looks wrong. And then I was able to fix it. And that was like, for me, like a super satisfying experience because, you know, when I was in school doing 3D, I just rendered like randomly, oh, I just put in like, I need three spotlights, you know, key light bounce and stuff, but I didn't really internalize it. I didn't really understand it. But the moment I actually understood it, all of a sudden, you know, a whole new door opened, you know, and then now it's, it's more like a tool to get to what I want, right? That's perfect, man. I, I totally get it. What I... I actually, um, what you said is perfect. I just made like practically and like fucking like technical because I I, I know you we, we do need to to, to know the the lightning part on uh, how to actually light it. But like how do you um you you eliminate it in here? But um if you want to make it better, just because you know the tech the technical part of it, how do you actually um, keep the same lighting that you produce it here in Quill? And then if, when you add it to the software, how do you add both together how do you you know like just like a next step yeah um yeah i'm still actually experimenting with um what it's possible there and like you saw my rat piece the sewer rat piece maybe um that i rendered uh, which was lit just like this and i was like what if i just bring the vertex color in with the where the lighting is painted but then I add lighting on top and then I got yeah. this crazy result. So it was actually like more like a coincidence where I just tried something because I, I usually what I do, you know, um, before bringing things into Redshift, it's just one color, right? So for example, um, my biker dude, you know, um, it's basically like this, you know, and then I have maybe a, a jacket like this, right? So this is usually what I bring into uh into um, yeah. maya and and that was the first time where i actually did this and brought it in and it looked really crazy you know and like i actually don't know what this would look like but if i would use this i would probably make sure that the lighting is somewhat consistent that the light is coming from there so the shadows that redshift or octane will produce will match the shadows that i painted right um but um yeah, I'm still actually experimenting with that. Um, I did want to make a stream about um, how to bring um, Quill assets into 3D software, but it gets really, really technical. Uh, I think people like, you know, you're probably familiar with 3D software, but people that are not, you know, it's a lot to digest because it doesn't end yeah. with the import, you know, it's like building a shader that reads the vertex color and you know building the node tree with displacement maps and bump maps and stuff with all the settings around but it doesn't end there right then you build a camera and how do you do that for field and like i haven't found a way to do this that quickly you know because what you see in my end results it's actually like you know there's a lot of prep work that happens to do that. Like you can't just hit render and it will happen, you know? <laughs> so um yeah. usually it's like a pretty boring process to watch unless it's like planned through because a lot of shading and rendering is trial and error right so i would have to like um um tyler already suggested to do one stream like that and i'm planning to do this but it needs to be planned through and i haven't had the time to do that because i don't want to confuse you guys with me just trying out settings and then you know putting in some random values of 0.02 and you, you guys are like what what the hell is he doing you know because it can easily go into that that realm where I just like try things, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. and that, case, that that's exactly what I wanted to see. It. <laughs> that's exactly that's the part that is. Like, yeah, I mean a little bit of that is good, <laughs> but whenever I learn from YouTube tutorials, I usually get like super irritated if the person makes mistakes, like because I want to learn a specific thing, right? Yeah, and if so, the yeah. person is like, oh, maybe you change the value here, maybe you change it here. Oh, wait, let me go back, you know. And then it's like, come on, dude, like I'm trying to learn here, right? <laughs> so it's different. Yeah. I think there's a difference between making mistakes while painting and fixing it along the way versus when you want to really show a workflow, then it needs to be condensed to the information you need, you know, and this is like what I'm trying to do and like trying to find a way to condense it to one hour, which is also difficult because the rendering stuff usually takes longer than the painting part, right? Because you have to build the uh, shader trees, you have to build the cameras and stuff like that. And of course you can build presets beforehand, but if I show 
then I want to show you guys how I do it from the ground up, right? And then you have to deal with like connection editors and distance tools to create depth of field and stuff like that. It gets really, really technical, you know, and that's something that a lot of people, I think, don't realize how complicated Maya is, you know, it's really Thank not very intuitive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, um, this was the lesson for today. Thanks for tuning in and see you guys next time.